want to thank uh, uh, Paolo Diego Bubio and Chris Fleming for inviting me back to attend this genuinely international conference and, and to in Imitatio for sponsoring it. Uh, um, my presentation uh, today will be about uh, Ex Machina, as the, as the, the title uh, suggests to you. And I want to start with a, a head note quote. But before I do that, it occurs to me it would be interesting for you to see what she looks like in the audience uh, when, you, when you first come into the film. So I'm just going to, uh, assuming everything goes well here, I'm just going to press the, just to give you a couple of image shots of her. He's first seeing her, and, and we're first seeing her. Notice the transparency. We see through her. Hello. Hi. I'm Caleb. All right, I'm going to stop this now. Hello, Caleb. Let's do it. Okay. Okay. And my head note uh, for this presentation is the following. So, Nathan, uh, this is uh, you have your sheets, right? You, everyone have a copy of the sheet. So this is the, the, the quote number one. If, so anyway, um, surely now is when you tell me if Ava passed or, or failed the test. Right, right, right. right. Uh, are you going to keep me in suspense? No, no, no. Her, her AI is beyond doubt. Well, is it? Is it? She passed. Yes. Wow. Wow, that's fantastic. Although, I've got to say, I'm a bit surprised. I mean, did we ever really get past the, the chess problem, as you phrased it, as in... How do you know if it's a machine expressing a real emotion or just simulating one? Does Ava actually like you or not? Uh, although now that I think about it, there's a third option. Not whether she does or does not have the capacity to like you, but whether she's pretending to like you. Uh, pretending to like you. Yeah. Well, why would she do that? I don't know. Maybe if she thought of you as a means of escape. Okay. I'm uh, Like Paul, I'm not going to... Uh, uh, introduce Renee Girard's thought here. I'm going to assume uh, we have a certain understanding of, of the three basic ideas that the desire is appropriated, that uh, this appropriation in archaic culture is organized around uh, the sacrificial and scapegoat mechanism, and, and Judeo Christianity exposes this in, in the, uh, the Jewish and Christian scriptures. But I'm going to move on to the, the, the question that I want to address today, which is how does the work of Renee Girard open us to a discussion? of mimetic theory in film. Luckily for me, I don't have to do the spade work on this topic. Because sitting in this room is the man who has has uh, uh, done some of that spade work. Since since the entire book last I launched last year, addressing it at the annual Australian Girard Seminar, I had the honor, and I had the honor of launching it. Uh, I'm referring, of course, to the Mimesis movies and media book that Chris put in front of us. Uh, contained an article by, by Paul Dumouchel uh, called Mirrors of Nature, Artificial Agents in Real Life and Virtual Worlds. And I want to read from the final paragraph of, of Dumouchel's article. And after an opening section on Hobbes and the majority of the article in Spielberg's film Artificial Intelligence, Dumouchel concludes, as he must know, it's exactly right. Conclusion, Dumouchel writes, we may ask, what does it, this is uh, number two, what does it take for an artificial agent to appear real? He, it, must be mimetic, vulnerable, non-autonomous in its desire, capable of violence, and we must further be ready to recognize it as the origin of its own actions. Okay, now I want to argue that Dumichel's list of qualifiers for what's required for an artificial agent to appear real, namely that it be mimetic, vulnerable, non-autonomous in its desire, capable of violence, we recognize as the origin of the, our own actions, seems to me to apply, seems to me to apply perfectly to uh, Initially, it was going to be two films. It was going to be Ex Machina and, and Her, but today I'm just going to talk about uh, Ex Machina. And, and it seems to me to apply perfectly to Ex Machina. And so, in effect, you could say, starting with Dumichel's characterization, I would like to pick up where, where Paul Dumichel uh, leaves off. 
So Ava, uh, in Ex Machina, the humanoid robot that you see on the screen in front of you, and Alex, Alex Garland's Ex Machina, is, an, is utterly mimetic and imitative. She presents herself as entirely vulnerable and is thoroughly and completely dependent upon and knowledgeable of the desires of all those around her, which have been fed to her electronically from all around the world. And here's a quote from Nathan's remarks. I switched on all the mics and cameras across the entire planet, Nathan says, he, and he's her reclusive creator. It says to Caleb, her interrogator, and redirected the data through my own company, which is a company kind of like Google plus Microsoft, something like that. Boom, he says, a limitless resource of facial and vocal interaction. And Ava, of course, is supremely capable of violence, as we're going to learn in the film's final stark conclusion. All right, so part two, passing the Turing test, Ex Machina and the Imitation Game. One of the reasons I jumped on the chance to speak uh, about Ex Machina in this context is that it takes place, we may say, just before or on the cusp of what is known in the AI universe as singularity. That is to say, uh, the moment that machines acquire self-awareness and as such maintain, and as such the film maintains a somewhat closer relationship to our world than other films that we might consider. For example, her, in which it's already become commercialized. Uh, you can actually buy it as an operating system. Here, we're, we're just, it's, it's either just before or just during it happening, right? So we're, we're kind of seeing it in a way that we can still relation, have a relationship to our own world. And this status, perched, so to speak, on the cusp, uh, is, it seems to me is reflected in the title. The Latin preposition ex can mean out of, as in leaving or saying goodbye to, bidding adieu, what was formerly mine but now no longer mine. Or alternatively, ex can mean from within, from the middle, in the thick of some activity. Uh, thus, the, the title ex machina refers to both what comes out of and as a result of machines and what remains still at the same time entirely within their province. But the phrase ex machina also, of course, inevitably uh, echoes the words Deus ex machina, which referred to the moment in certain plays in classical Greek or Roman literature, in which the gods of mythology were said to have stepped out of their customary place within the divine order and entered the realm of human interaction. Moreover, the very words Deus ex machina occur in the film. It's not really seen when you watch the film, but if you actually re read the script as I did, uh, you actually find the words to be on the computer screen that Nathan has as the name of a directory. They occur, they occur on the screen, in the film uh, you know, on, as the name of a directory on Nathan's desktop device where he stores information about each of the female robotic creatures that he has constructed. So he thinks of himself as deus ex machina, in effect. Right? In this case, then, the phrase, deus ex, the phrase ex machina would invoke a kind of double exit, both from within and as a consequence of machines, and a move away from the gods entirely, entering into the world uh, to create out of or from within machines alone, without the need for participation of any supernatural agency, uh, what is generally called AI or artificial intelligence. So, next, next part. The passage cited above in, in, in my head note uh, is about passing or failing uh, reflect and reflects a, a key turning point in Ex Machina. Caleb is a young, low-level techie working for a mega a uh, large international corporation, a kind of combination of Google and, and Microsoft, as I said, who suddenly finds himself the sole winner of a coveted prize, a week alone with the company's reclusive CEO. Flown by helicopter to his mount the CEO's mountainside resort, a mountainside mansion, the nerdy underling quickly learns that the boss has been developing a humanoid model for his latest experiments in, in AI and that the young man is to test these robots employing the so-called Turing test. The test that English mathematician Alan Turing proposed shortly after the Second World War in response to the question, can, can machines think? And in the section of the paper, he t which he titled, Not Without Significance for Our Purposes, The Imitation Game. I think <laughs> it's from Alan Turing. The Imitation Game is a phrase from Alan Turing. The test involves a determination regarding what is sometimes called in the AI universe, the moment, this moment of singularity, which I mentioned to you, uh, a determination as to whether or not the robotic machine has achieved in effect the level of sophistication that would count in the human realm as self-awareness. Okay. Turns out in the film that the CEO has built a robot in the form of a, an attractive woman whose name the uh, Caleb and we will learn is Ava, 
And that the majority of the film concerns is the Caleb's interaction with Ava and with Nathan, the CEO, and with a Japanese servant, Kyoko, who turns out to be a rejected earlier model of the robot, who is now employed exclusively for household chores, for sexual entertainment, and for food service. <laughs> Three things that I guess academics <laughs> need them as, as uh, in, in, in the sense to business as well. The plot of the film follows up to a point a fairly predictable course. Caleb arrives, Nathan informs him that he is participating in the version of the Turing test uh, with the AI that he has built. He talks with him a bit about the non-disclosure agreement that he will have to sign, which he signs. He shows him to his room, gives him his key, as, and some doors open to him, some doors not open to him, and he leaves him to sleep. In the morning, Caleb meets Ava. And this is the scene where Caleb meets Ava that I've just shown you. She's a robot, and her mechanical parts are clearly visible. That's why I showed you the scene. You can see through her. You can see the mechanical parts, right? And it's, it's done so well on the screen that it's hard to say, this, this is not makeup, right? In some way, this, has, this, this can't be. This is a creature that literally can't be in, in the way that we understand uh, how these things go. So it has to be a trick of some kind, but we're not sure how. Okay, the, the, uh, fir the first interaction, okay, she's a robot, mechanical, uh, uh, clearly visible, transparently. So when we first see her, she appears exceedingly thin and the mechanical nature of her body is apparent, although covered with a kind of metallic netting or mesh. And you can still see kind of the mesh or the netting on the, the top there. But when we see her up close, we notice that her head is that of an attractive young girl. The first interaction is fairly mundane. They exchange names, inform information about people they've met or not met, talk about how old she is. One, she says. He says one. Well, one what? Just one. <laughs> one. Uh, how long she's been speaking the language. She says she's always known how to speak the language, and so forth. All right, she's fascinating, Caleb, Caleb later uh, exclaims to Nathan. That night he realizes there's a TV camera that feeds directly on Ava. And then when the power is cut, it's restored, and he wanders out and tries to find a phone, uh, and, and he, he runs into uh, Nathan, who says, really, you, you can't call out, and blah, 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 blah. I'm going to skip a little bit here. Next morning, he's awakened by the Japanese serving girl, Kyoko. The drama of the film will now suddenly change tone, switching from something of a science fiction exhibition to a potential mystery thriller. Right? Tone has changed. Caleb learns now from Ava during one of the blackouts that she has sur that it turns out that she has surreptitiously arranged that Nathan is not to be trusted. They have been talking about the nature of friendship that is necessarily two-sided or bi-directional, and here's the exchange that occurs. This is number three on your your cheat sheet. Is Nathan your friend? My, my friend? I Yeah, I hope so. A good friend. Um, yeah, well, no, I mean, a, 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 not a good friend. A, a good friend is, well, we don't just met each other, you know, so it takes time to be, to get to know each other. Then there's the uh, alarming blast, female voice, power cut, backup power activated, and Ava, Caleb, you're wrong. You're wrong about what, Nathan? In what way? He isn't your friend. Excuse me? I'm sorry, Ava, I don't understand. You shouldn't trust him. You shouldn't trust anything he says. Female voice, power restored. And that's, what, that's our first indication. Something bizarre is taking place here. Right? And, if we, and she goes on, if we made a list of books or works of art, as if, as if the conversation has not deviated from before the blackout. Okay. The dialogue plays upon the fears that Caleb already harbors about Nathan and that the audience also has been encouraged to feel. So that when Ava's, Ava subsequently informs Caleb that she wants to escape, he's prepared to assist her. During the second blackout in the middle of their interview, he questions her about her previous claim. Why did you tell me that I shouldn't trust, this is number four, why did you tell me I shouldn't trust Nathan? Because he lies. He lies about what? Everything. And when he reveals to her that she is in effect uh, being tested in court with the Turin test, which we'll talk about in a moment, she solicits more information. Five, number five. What will happen to me if I fail your test, Ava? Will it be bad? Uh, I don't know. Do you think I might be switched off because I don't function as well as I'm supposed to? Ava, I, I don't know the answer to your question. It's not up to me. Well, why is it up to anyone? Do you have people who test you and might switch you off? <laughs> That's another. <laughs> Not naive that he is, he says, no, I don't. <laughs> and then, then why do I? Then why do I? Caleb is nonplussed. Is not 
He doesn't want to reveal what he suspects, and in fact confirms later that Nathan plans to close her down, build a new model, a new and improved model, that he has doubts about the procedure on his own. And when she indicates her desires more boldly, he will respond more boldly. Uh, number six, I want to be with you. This is very important. She expresses her desire to him directly. I want to be with you. Uh, and uh, the B. Question five, do you want to be with me? Yes, I do. Nathan doesn't want us to be together. I know. So ask me one more question. Ask me if I can outsmart him. Can you? Uh, yes, I can. Yeah, I can. And finally, he takes up her challenge. Uh, number seven, don't talk. Just listen. You were right about Nathan. Everything you said. What's he going to do to me? He's going to reprogram your AI, what, which is the same as killing you. Caleb, you have to help me. I'm going to. We're getting out of here tonight. And so he is planning to assist her escape. Okay. But Nathan, it turns out, has other plans for them. You, Nathan, you did not win, a, in effect, you did not win a contest to get here as you thought you did. Nathan now, now informs him as you, you, were, you were, in fact, picked. The Turing test involved a human component and a computer. You were, in fact, the human component. I already know that these models have self-awareness. I sit behind the computer screen and I watch both of you. The question is, what follows from that? How much are these creatures willing to do in order to escape? Because they have extraordinary powers of imitation and the capacity to know when one is telling the truth and when one is lying, they could use your responses to their advantage. Uh, number eight, Nathan, uh, Nathan now challenges Caleb's assessment of the situation. Nathan, how do you know if a machine is expressing a real emotion or just simulating one? Does Ava actually like you or not? Although now that I think about it, there's a third option. Not whether she likes you or not, or not whether she has the capacity to like you, or whether she's pretending to like you. I, I, this, this was my head name for us. Pretending to like, yeah. Well, why would she do that? I don't know. Maybe if she thought you were a means of escape. Caleb still thinks, however, that he has outsmarted Nathan. Uh, he has reprogrammed the door so that when there is a further blackout, the doors will reopen, uh, will open instead of locking as they did previously the first time that we experiences the door's lock. And in fact, as he tells Nathan of, their of his surreptitious gesture, the blackout occurs, and then Ava is seen on the computer screen exiting her enclosure. So the net third part of the movie has begun. But Caleb hasn't taken into account all possible contingencies. Upon hearing that Caleb, what Caleb has done, and noticing that Ava is now exiting her room, Nathan immediately decks him, and <laughs> Taking the weights of the end of a metal bar, he goes to retrieve Ava, right? going to retrieve her physically. He confronts her in the hallway. He asks her to return to her room. If I do, are you ever going to let me out, she says, and begins running towards him. He raises the bar, strikes her as she reaches him, breaking off a part of her arm, exposing its mangled mechanical parts, pinning her to the floor. But Kyoko now unexpectedly comes at him with a knife. Should we see a little scene where, Ky where, where Kyoko and Ava have been talking. We assume m machine language because we're told that she doesn't speak English. So presumably he's spoken to, uh, um, Ava has spoken to her in algorithms, in, in, in computer instructions. And so, because suddenly, out of the blue, she comes at Nathan with a knife, comes at him with a knife, stabbing him in the back. Nathan turns and smashes Kyoko across the face with a bar, and she falls to the floor lifeless, half of her face gone. And the, mechan the mechanism now hideously exposed. But now Ava also finishes what Kyoko started. As Nathan turns to attack Kyoko, Ava stabs Nathan in the back and then in the front in a passionless, repetitive, mechanical manner. She just goes like this. Not like, I'm going to get you, you know, but just simply in and out like that. Nathan wanders away from her in utter shock. Things, so things like, shit, <laughs> I just can't believe this is happening. Something like that. Yeah. And a sudden unthinkable reversal of events, and he falls impotently to the floor. Caleb now suddenly revives <laughs> from being decked by Nathan, Nathan, and would now accompany Ava from the facility. He thinks, you know, he thinks the, the escape is now on, right? But Ava has plans of her own. Proceeding to the room where Caleb is reviving, she asks him to wait for, wait for me here. She says, wait for me. And then she retreats to adorn herself with the skin, the hair, and the clothing of the earlier abandoned female models, which she puts on and, and walks out looking indistinguishable from a, a woman. Returning to the room where Caleb dutifully waits for her, she blithely locks Caleb in the room, 
calmly walks to the living room in which the conversations between Nathan and Caleb have taken place and exits the building to the helicopter that's waiting outside. After conversing briefly with the, the helicopter pilot, and we do not hear what they are saying, she enters the aircraft and the vehicle flies off. In the last shot that we have of her, she stands astride a busy civic intersection, watching people and traffic pass around her, oblivious to her presence as the credits begin to appear on the movie screen. All right, so that's the film that we have now to, to kind of examine. All right, so the plot turns, in, in, in my view, on her capacity to be hypermimetic, to read accurately all human tells. And you understand that a tell is, we, we, according to modern theory of, of human interaction, we have thousands of ways that we indicate we're telling the truth and not telling the truth, and people can learn to read these tells. There's, there's books, that, you know, when you, when you fly a lot, you see books that say, all human tells reveal. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> buy these books and you know, learn how to tell when people are lying. You come to become, in, in effect, human lie detector test machines. She has been programmed to know every possible response for every possible remark, much as a chess computer knows every possible move in, in response to every possible move made by the opponent. She has learned to discern when people are lying uh, or telling the truth. She has become, in effect, a human lie detector machine. And so when, when uh, whether or not she likes Caleb, she has, in effect, imitated affection for him uh, to, in order to engineer her own escape through an elaborate strategy of flirtation, seduction, and enclosure. And the movie has been especially cagey about interpreting its villains and its heroes. Initially, Nathan is presented as the villain, and Caleb and, and Ava are offered as the, as the innocents. Caleb, the nerdish computer geek, inexperienced with women, and Ava, the vulnerable, trapped, good-hearted victim of Nathan's wiles, uh, then suddenly things change. When Caleb tricks Nathan, the tables alter slightly, and Caleb takes over Nathan's role as a trickster with regard to Nathan and Ava, and now Ava assumes the role of a willing transgressor to right the injustice that Nathan has imposed upon her. And finally, when Ava speaks in computer language to Kyoko and arranges Kyoko's subsequent stabbing of Nathan, she finishes the job of killing Nathan, and she locks Caleb, who has only worked in her behalf, in the computer room, in effect killing him because of the remoteness of his location to the outside world. We haven't made a discussion about this, but I think I think it's we, we're to assume that he's in some danger. Here. He's, he may he may not make it out of there. Uh, she has assumed, in short, in in full, the role of agent and perpetrator of violence, that the, and the others have now become her victims. It seems to me that's that's clear. And the movie, as a result, raises for us certain nagging doubts about the ethical. She has entered society. She has no qualms about killing or constraining whoever is in her way. She is not entirely distinct in that regard from a pathological killer or a pathological liar. And she has acquired self-awareness, but she has not been programmed uh, along with that awareness for a semblance of ethical commitment, only for escape and self-aggrandizement. She is, in effect, a being who has been designed in terms of what phenomenologists would identify as pure ego. She's pure ego. How are we to understand this film? The key, I suggest, may be the repeated reference to the Turing test and the way in which it is un understood by its historical progenitor as an imitation game. If this were a longer seminar, at this point we would read the, uh, the essay by Alan Turing and then comment in detail on it, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna just kind of summarize very quickly here. At the heart of the ex machina, is the Turing test, the test proposed by Alan Turing, generally credited with the origin of computers or the universal machine, regarding whether computers can think. A topic he explained in the paper, apparently in one section, as I mentioned to you, is titled The Imitation Game. The idea derived from this paper was that if you sat behind a wall of some kind and spoke to two sources on the other side of the wall, if you could not decide which one was a computer or which one is human, the computer had passed the Turing test and had, in fact, attained self-awareness. Uh, I say derived because in the original paper by Alan Turing, the test concerns whether an interrogator can determine which of the two speakers on the other side of the wall is male and which is female, which is much closer to what we have in the movie if we imagine the Turing test, I'm going to suggest to you, is conducted by Nathan and not so much conducted by Caleb on Ava. It's conducted by Nathan. The question is of, of a male and a female relationship in a certain way. Uh, here is how, and then uh, uh, in number nine, I've given you uh, the example of, of, of the language of Turing. I'm going to skip this for purposes of time. How am I doing, Tom? Be fine, Sandy. Fine. And okay. we, it, lunch is long, so we can push gently into that if we need to. All right, okay. 
All right, here we go. Um, in the movie, I would like to suggest there are not one Turing test, but at least four of them. Okay. There is the Turing test that Caleb thinks that he's running and for which he was called from the company to determine whether and to, if so, to what extent Ava is human, which is to say self-aware. As in the Turing test that uh, Alan Turing writes about, he conducts his experiment behind the screen. You know, you saw, I don't know if you can see it, but there, she's behind the screen. She's not able to, to be accessed by, uh, by Caleb. Uh, and, and he turn, but he turn, as it turns out, the screen has a flaw, the nature of which we will learn about later. It has a, some, some break in, not break into it, but it looks like it was smashed at one point, but one couldn't get through it. Uh, there is, then there's the Turing test, that's, uh, that's the first Turing test. Now, then there's the Turing test that Nathan is running, Turing test two, on Caleb, and Caleb, as Caleb will eventually learn, to see whether, to what extent, he falls for Ava's interest in escaping through her use of sexuality, flirtation, vulnerability as a seductive strategy. Ava was a mouse in a mouse trap, Nathan says at one point, and I gave her one way out. To escape, she would have to use imagination, sexuality, self-awareness, empathy, manipulation, and she did. This is still Nathan speaking. And, and if that is an AI, then what the fuck is? <laughs> so that's, a, that's, a, that's a quote. It's a quote. That's a quote from, from Nathan. Yeah. Similar to the, the screen behind which Caleb sits, Nathan sits behind a computer screen and observes the interaction of the two of them repeatedly. But there's number three. There's also the Turing test that Ava uses to escape from her captors and that runs in effect on both Caleb and Nathan, as well as the helicopter pilot in the final scene. She lures Caleb into believing that she can be his girlfriend. I'd like to go on a date, she says to him at one point. Um, and then she adds, are you attracted to me? You gave me indications that you are. And she, hear, she lures Nathan into believing that he can control Caleb in the young man's idealistic innocence and enthusiasm, and that the blackouts are the result of bad workmanship on the construction of the facility. Nathan thinks, says, it's like these power cuts. You, you wouldn't believe how much I spent on the generator system, Nathan says, but I'm getting power cuts every day. And then Caleb asks, you know where they're coming from? He says, no, the system was supposed to be bulletproof, but the guys who installed it obviously fucked up somewhere. And, and then later on, this, that was Nathan's quote from Nathan, right? And then she lures the helicopter pilot uh, who has come to pick up someone human, right? That's what we know. Helicopter pilot does not expect there to be a robot, but someone human. And she lures him into believing that she is human, a situation which is, in fact, perhaps most like the original Turing test, since whatever she says to him, we are not permitted to hear what she says, she manages to convince him to take her to the city. And so the, it doesn't matter what they say. Whatever she says, they fly off. In other words, it's a Turing test. That's what's going on in that final interaction, as I read it. And there's finally, and here's the fourth Turing test, uh, that the audience undergoes and that the director is running on us, getting us to believe that Ava is in fact fully humanoid and not a digital projection on the screen, even while seeing her on the screen and understanding that it cannot be as it appears. Every movie, of course, is to some extent a Turing test in that sense since we know that we are watching a reflection of light projected onto a screen and not a group of people either in a real or theatrical interaction in front of us. And that sooner or later, the room lights will come on and the people will, uh, and the audience will be expected to leave. I'm thinking of the Purple Rose of Cairo in the Woody Allen film where he's on the screen and suddenly he comes off the screen and does enter and interacts with the people. In the movie. So, but that plays against our expectation that that can happen, right? So that's what Woody Allen can uh, do precisely because of this. We customarily come to regard these projections on the screen as real people with real interactions within a real world which they have come, in which we have come contractually to suspend our disbelief. Although in a science fiction film, such as this one by genre, uh, it's sometimes difficult to maintain that illusion. In this case, however, we are not simply told she's a machine, but we see that she is one from the outset and have no difficulty imagining her to be a machine who acts like a human being. Visual technology is not, in this case, a hindrance to our doing that. At each level, in other words, there is a play between what the observer or the interrogator knows and what he or she does not know. Caleb thinks he is the interrogator and that she is the subject, although he will later learn she may be pretending to interact with him to further her own ends. From Nathan's point of view, behind his computer screen, he is the interrogator of both Caleb and Ava, who are his subjects, 
Ava, the mechanical robotic subject he created, and Caleb, the human subject he has deliberately chosen and put into place for this experiment. Although he was without the knowledge that she controls the blackouts and that Caleb has taken advantage of Nathan's drunken stupor to swipe his keyboard and key card and reprogram the computers in order to let her escape. In other words, to empower her generation of, of power failures. From Ava's point of view, this is uh, the third, Ava's point of view, behind her screen, and as a consequence of the blackouts that she knows she is able to occasion, and the response she's able to generate in Caleb, all three, Caleb, Nathan, and her, she herself, are the subjects of her experiments and of her learning. And in the case of the pilot, nothing appears to be known about the mechanical or robotic nature of the humanoid figure who approaches him and who thoroughly convinces him to give her a ride to the city. So he flies off with her. And we, we the audience, of course, who also think that we are given all the information regarding Caleb, Nathan, and Ava, turn out deceived as well when against all of our expectations, Ava enters the city undetected, protected against the revelation of her robotic nature by the attractive female humanoid skins that she has donned. Consider the chess problem. <laughs> Consider the chess problem. Caleb, des uh, Caleb describes the chess problem to Nathan, which turns on the difference between a computer, which knows all the moves, and a human being who knows all the moves, but also has self-awareness, and, 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 and the fact that he's playing chess. It's the difference, one might say, between simulation and actuality, number 10. Test and gave it by conversations, kind of closed loop. Trying to test a, a chess computer by playing only chess. How else would you test a chess computer? Well, it depends on what you're doing it for, Caleb says. You can play it to find out if it makes good movies, mo moves, but it won't tell you if it knows it's playing chess. Or if it even if it knows what chess is, Nathan, uh, starting to add. So it's simulation and virtual and versus the actual. Exactly, and I think being able to differentiate between those two is the Turing test you want me to perform, the difference between an AI and, and an I. Uh, Caleb will later think that he knows all the moves. I, th I think it's a, that phrase that needs to be unpacked, the difference between an AI and an I. And that's really, in many ways, the heart of the movie, the difference between an AI and an I. Uh, anyway, uh, so... Caleb thinks he knows all the moves. Nathan will, in effect, say to him, there are more moves going on than you know about. From your point of view, it was the other status as computer, and yours as self-aware. But from where I sat, you were the computer, and she was playing you, letting you think that only you had self-awareness. The upshot of all these four cases, or these four levels, on which the Turing test is undertaken, is that she passes. Right? She passes. She passes as human for Caleb, who manages to attract who she manages to attract as a cohort in her plan to escape. She passes as human for Nathan, who she manages to kill through her capacity to speak to the Japanese servant, who in effect she quickly reprograms. She passes as human for herself, as she ends up escaping from the research facility and walking in the crowded city intersection, presumably undetected. And she passes for human for us, as she puts on the skin and the attractive feminine clothing, which is why the, costume, the outcome is so disturbing. Passing for human on the basis of hypermimesis alone, without any discernible sense of the ethical or, or of moral compass, leaves us in a disturbing conundrum. Without any trace of an ethical commitment, she has used sexuality, vulnerability, and a sense of outrage at oppression to, a potentially, to potentially at least promote the same. The movie, in the end, is about tells and about hyperimitation about the use of sexuality, seduction, sympathy, moral outrage as a means of rebellion, murder, and escape. It is about AI just on the cusp of singularity or self-awareness, where AI is in effect indistinguishable from an automaton or a soulless pathological serial murderer. Here's my last part. You doing okay with time? Right. All right. Let me now, in my concluding uh, section, add to the horror, <laughs> rather than diminish it. Let me, let me bring mimetic theory to bear about the problem which we have discussed, we are discussing. If the movie says to us in effect that hypermimesis is no guarantee of the ethical, that one does not follow from the other, that the, the latter does not follow necessarily from the former, then does the movie quote unquote get it wrong in Girardian terms? Is there in Girardian theory an ethical component to which we can appeal even if the movie does not? And here is the beginning of what Scott and I have had as a long conversation over several months, actually. Uh, and I'm just going to give you a very small bit of it here, just to kind of allow us to finish up with this. 
The answer, in my view, is an unmitigated no. There is no necessary path in Girard's view from the mimetic to the ethical. People of goodwill, both within the traditional religious orientations and outside of traditional religious orientations, and whether of Jewish, Christian, Hindu, Buddhist, Islamic, or other varieties, have long want, wanted there to be one. Rebecca Adams, as we all know, tried val valiantly to get Girard to articulate positive mimesis, a surefire way of moving from a destructive, conflictual, violent mimesis to one that aligned itself with familiar ethical understandings. But Girard steadfastly refused. The theory he was offering was, and in my view remains, essentially anthropological. Whether it shows up within Greek tragedy, within Hebrew scriptures, or within the texts of the Synoptic Gospels and the Pauline letters. The fact that Girard himself identifies as a practicing, committed, believing uh, Roman Catholic in no way compromises this systematic or theoretical position. Girardianism stops at the door of the ethical, even if Girard the man does not. That, that's really my view. The rest of it is kind of an elaboration of that. Uh, in fact, because Girardianism does not commit us to one or another form of ethical practice, because it remains strictly diagnostic as a diagnostic tool of the structure of the sacrificial, both as generative source of all order and of disorder in the archaic and modern universe, we are free to make of it what we will. It's because it's not ethical or, or anti-ethical that we can do what, it, what we want. Girard is free to adopt an Augustinian Catholic ethical position, which is how he, identify, he identifies himself as as a Roman Catholic. Robert Hamerton Kelly was free to adopt a Lutheran Pauline Protestant ethical position. Raman Schwager was free to adopt a systematic theological position emphasizing original sin. James Allison is free to adopt a Johannine position emphasizing the forgiving victim. I am free to adopt a Levinasian, Buberian, Rosenzweigian prophetic Jewish position. <laughs> and everyone's free to do what they want. <laughs> And any of you are free to adopt any position you like, ridic ridiculous or not. Right? <laughs> but as long as it's amenable to your own religious or other than religious sensibilities. And all of us may remain thoroughly and identically, nonetheless, card-carrying Girardi. That's my hope. That's my hope. All right. Now, I, I have a long passage where I, I, show, I try to show that this is operative in Benoit Chantre's uh, conversation with him in his last book. I'm going to skip that because I do want to get to just the very end of this and then we can uh, move on. I'm happy to read it if, if, if it comes up in discussion or to talk about it if it comes up in discussion. All right, where does this account of mimetic theory leave us vis-a-vis -vis Ava? And this is where, where I will stop. Let me recall what is said about Ava at the outset. Ava, we noted, following Du Michel's criterion, is utterly mimetic and imitative. She presents herself as entirely vulnerable, completely dependent upon, and knowledgeable about the desires of those around her, which have been led to her, fed to her electronically from all around the world. And Ava, of course, is supremely capable of violence, as we learned in the film's stark conclusion. But we are left, we left out, and I was very cagey in doing this, one criteria that, in, that was in Du Michel's list, namely that she appeared that to appear real, a robotic agent must be non-autonomous in this desire. Ava, in my view, is thoroughly autonomous in her desire, although she appears entirely vulnerable. In fact, it would have almost appear that she has no desires at all other than the desire to persist in her own being, which as a, as a philosophic concept, which comes from Spinoza and Descartes and Leibniz, is called the canatus ascending, the desire to persist in one's own being. Uh, her sur which is her survivalist desire, to remove any and all obstacles in the path of that happening, of her survival happening. Unless perhaps we include the desire to observe people, to, to visit a busy intersection, which is where she appears to be at the film's conclusion, and to people watch. If she has desires, to people watch. That's what she wants, to people watch. That, that's the most we can say of Ava's desire. From the point of view of a medic theory, in other words, Ava is something of an anomaly. She is at once thoroughly appropriative and mimetic, and yet curiously without desire. Especially if we mean, understand by desire, le manque, lack, which is how the French uh, 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 often talk about desire. Or longing to be another, the way, for example, that Girard analyzes the heroes of the great romantic, the, the great novelistic tradition, or the way Jacques Lacan, the French psychoanalyst, speaks about it in psychoanalysis. She reprograms Kyoko to stab Nathan and then finishes the job herself. She locks Caleb in the computer room 
where we assume he will inevitably die because of the remoteness of his location to any possible assistance. And she does all three without any excess of passion. Indeed, any, if any passion at all. Her gestures towards Nathan seem strikingly mechanical. With Caleb, she is simply blithe. With Kyoko, she is thoroughly machine-like. The slight momentary hint that she may be soliciting the help of Kyoko in an act of sisterly rebellion against male oppression is rebuffed when she casually leaves Kyoko on the floor in the hallway as a switched off heap of twisted metal, a clattering collection of colliginous junk, as, as, as Barbara reminds me, the Wizard of Oz <laughs> talked about it. Uh, the des which is the, precisely, in other words, the destiny of her most fear, that she most feared earlier. Indeed, noticing that Caleb and, uh, sorry, that Nathan and Kyoko lie motionless on the floor, she moves to the storage facility to strip the old skin from off of the switched off models. I mean, it's an extraordinary thing about it. Does she know, for example, that they are terminated? What, is it possible that they will wake up soon and find they were that without skin? Uh, looking much the way that she did in her interactions with Caleb, she has become, in short, a scavenger. She appropriates their clothing, even their very skin, all the elements of their appearance, but not, but not their being with regard to which it would seem she is, in fact, leech, at least structurally, competitive. She is, in short, hypermimetic, more mimetic than anyone we know or could imagine. She appropriates everything, but she seems singularly without desire. It's a curious anomaly to have those two go together, other than for her own self-preservation, which for her is paramount. She is like an animal raised, and this is what comes to my conversation with, with Scott, an animal raised only for fighting, or as Scott points out, an abused child who never really recovers, only worse. She is, I would say, more like a pathological serial killer who is never reachable. We surmise that there is no priest, no minister, no rabbi, or any other religious counselor, or any secular counselor, or psychologist, or, or psychoanalyst who could get to her. There are such people in the world, I would suggest. We often say they are wired differently, is how we sometimes talk about it. She's beyond metaphysical desire, or at least the variety that Renee examines. She's into something else. She's even beyond the will to power. I mean, uh, part of our discussion was, is she therefore an example of the will to power? She's even beyond the will to power, as we customarily talk about it, vis-a-vis -vis Nietzsche, uh, be because she's beyond the Napoleonic. She's probably more precisely Heideggerian than Nietzschean. Nietzsche ends up literally hugging a horse, right, in the streets of Turin at the onset of his madness. I don't think Ava would end up hugging anybody. Heidegger, on the other hand, ends up as a, as a card-carrying Nazi and speaks of the fact that all things desire to persist in their being, the famous Canadus ascending. Uh, Nietzsche saw being, which he read through Hegel, as a matter of power. Heidegger saw power, which he read through Nietzsche, as a matter of being. Her desire is ontologically grounded rather than metaphysically grounded. We don't sense that she feels any lack, which is how Hegel, Girard, Lacan, and others describe desire. She is pure machine, machine unleashed, so to speak, which I think really is the final translation of ex machina, machine unleashed. So uh, th that's how the title machine uh, ex machina from, uh, finally relates to her. We think that she is vulnerable, cute, solicitous of, and subject to our care for her and her welfare. We think Nathan is cruel and unfeeling towards her, witness her ripping up, witness his ripping up of her drawing, but that Caleb is and would be nicer to her, and we certainly like her. We root for her and Caleb to go on a date, as they say. We are drawn to her by her face, but what we perceive to be her vulnerability, her utter defenselessness, her utter nakedness, the face-to-face, -face, Manuel Levinas teaches us, speaks to us, and what it says is, thou shalt not kill. And so we're taken in by that. She's a fake Levinasian, so to speak. But in this case, no community could help her because from her point of view, all human beings are liars. She knows all the tells. Her first private words to Caleb, you recall, are, Nathan is lying. That's literally what she said, Nathan is lying. Don't trust him, he's not your friend. He lies about everything. We believe her to become, to, because to some extent, by that point in the movie, we share her point of view about Nathan. She, she, we will, she will like Caleb, and like us, we feel. She will value the fact that we on, are on her side, but is just one more ploy on her part to manipulate us as she manipulates Caleb. She is, at bottom, purely instrumentalist. She is beyond uh, redemption, as one might say in a religious context. She uses Caleb's offered friendship as a means to an end to bring about her escape. She is 
disdainful, that's the word that, uh, that Scott uh, employed here, she is disdainful of all human feeling and sense of desire as lack, not just of Nathan. After Caleb has sacrificed everything for her, career, uh, uh, his relation to Nathan, everything, she locks him in a room, leaves him there to die without a second thought. Even her murder of Nathan is passionless. She repeatedly stabs him mechanically. Thus, she thus will have and can have no friends, uh, unlike those on Facebook. You know, we have friends. And she gets along best with individuals like Kyoko, who literally, literally speak her language, which is to say machine language, algorithms, instructions, or with people who are there to service her, like the pilot or like Caleb. She knows all the mannerisms by which to seduce the, the, the Caleb's and the pilots of the world into working for her, to serving her ends. The only one she cannot seduce is Nathan, which is disconcerting to us since he is the one figure in the movie we are ready to dislike. He might be described in Marxist language as, uh, as the product, for, for example, this, this is God's characterization, again, of late capitalism. She is already somewhere else. Uh, another order of being, another planet, so to speak. Nietzsche promotes the will to power. Heidegger, despite the brilliance of his philosophic thinking, is a card-carrying Nazi. That's why it's hard for me, at least, to view the ending of the movie as anything other than creepy. She has entered society, and there's no telling to what degree anyone will be able to stop her. She will in be indistinguishable from any other human beings, and especially other women, and will, in fact, be attractive to men whom she will then be able to manipulate to do her will, which will, which again is simply to persist in being without terminus. She is like the Terminator in the third film of the Terminator series, who has the form of an attractive woman, but it was no less lethal for her visual appeal. In fact, she is more so. Uh, and so, uh, at root, the relation between mimesis and the ethical remains, at least from my point of view, an open one. Does the mimetic entail the ethical or can mimetic model survive without one? Does hyper mimetic, imagined in this movie as the mainstay of, of the AI agents, foreclose the ethical? C. Does the mimetic theory have an ethical component or, if not, some ethical advice to offer some coming scientific developments? Or is the ethical left to fend for itself before the tireless emergent creativity of contemporary scientific advancement? These are some of the questions with which a movie like Ex Machina leaves us and that can perhaps form the basis for our discussion. Thank you very much.